So the next uh, speaker is Dr. Chambliss. She uh, is a writer herself, and I'll let her uh, tell her own story. But uh, she's very knowledgeable about the sport as a competitor um, and as a physician and as a neurosurgeon. And so she knows a lot more about this topic than I do. So I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Chambliss. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank Riders for Helmets and Lindsay and Craig in particular for inviting me to come here and speak to you all today. This is a real privilege for me to be able to come and talk to you about two of my uh, favorite topics, neurosurgery and uh, the patients that we treat at work, and also my hobby, which is riding horses and has been for a long time. Uh, as Dr. Farrell said, uh, my career uh, really pretty much hang means I hang out in the operating room most of the time. I'm the chief resident in neurosurgery now at Vanderbilt University. Um, my particular interests are in brain tumors and uh, also in traumatic head injury. Um, when I'm not there, I'm often out at the farm riding. Um, I'm a former eventer and uh, uh, still hope to be back there within uh, the next year or so. I'm also a graduate A Pony Clubber. Um, I've evented through the two-star level and um, have uh, been riding throughout my whole life uh, in a variety of different disciplines. Today I'm actually going to give you two talks. This is my first talk where I'm really going to focus on uh, some of the issues related to major traumatic brain injury. Um, in my second talk I'm going to talk a little bit more about concussions as well as uh, prevention and some return to play issues like that. Um, today in this first talk I'm going to really talk about some of the epidemiology of, of brain injury in riders as well as um, the mechanisms of injury, how we diagnose severe traumatic brain injuries, how we deal with them medically, and what the outcomes are that we can expect. Just some definitions to begin with. You're going to hear the term TBI used a lot today. Uh, TBI refers to traumatic brain injury, and it's really a broad term that covers a spectrum of injuries. Everything from a concussion, a mild injury that's self-limited and has no long-term consequences, to a severe traumatic brain injury that causes coma and death uh, are included under that umbrella term. There's also another term that you're hearing more and more often in the popular media now, CTE or trauma chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a uh, diagnosis that's made in patients or particularly athletes who have suffered multiple concussions or other traumatic brain injuries over the course of an athletic career and uh, subsequently develop a chronic degenerative neurologic disorder that leads to early dementia and other problems. So to get a little bit into the epidemiology of uh, equestrian related brain injuries, uh, there are 1.7 million traumatic brain injuries overall diagnosed annually in the, in the United States. Of those uh, about 1.4 million, or just about three quarters of patients are treat seen in the emergency room, treated and released from the emergency room with no further treatment necessary. Uh, about just under 300,000 patients are hospitalized with traumatic brain injury in the United States every year. Of those, about 80,000 suffer permanent disability, and about 50,000 end up dying of those injuries and the related complications. About a third of those injuries are actually sports related. And the highest incidence of sports related head injuries is not surprisingly in adolescents and young adults. Within the world of equestrian sport, we have a serious problem. Horseback riding actually causes about 12% of all traumatic brain injuries amongst recreational sport. That's an incredibly high percentage for a sport that doesn't really have that many participants when compared to sports like football, soccer, swimming, etc. Um, in year 2009, which is the last year for which we have data available, there were about 14,000 ER visits for brain injuries amongst equestrians. Brain injuries comprise about a fifth of all equestrian-related injuries, but they're also the number one reason for hospital admission because they're typically the most serious. Uh, I find the next statistic a little frightening. Head injuries are the cause of death in 60% of equestrian fatalities. So these are 
far more common causes of death than crush injuries to the chest and some of those other things that we occasionally think about. Uh, interestingly, the height of the fall from the horse is the most significant factor in predicting injury severity, and that just relates to the force that your head strikes the ground with. In terms of the breakdown by discipline, uh, TBI is equally common in English and Western disciplines. There's two disciplines that have a significantly higher rate of TBI, and that's eventing and racing. Uh, one other sobering statistic, I think, is to compare uh, riding to something that we all think is pretty dangerous, I would imagine, which is motorcycle riding. I see motorcyclists out there and I say, why would anybody put themselves at risk like that? That's so dangerous. We see them all the time in the emergency room. Well, a motorcycle rider can expect to have one serious injury per about 5,000 hours of riding on average. An equestrian can expect to suffer one serious injury per about 350 hours of riding. And finally, I would just mention the um, relation to some of the other serious and dangerous sports that we hear about all the time in the United States. There's about eight deaths a year in the United States due to head injury in football, and that includes high school, college, professional football. There's 60 deaths per year in the United States related to head injury in equestrian sport. So I want to get into a little bit of the details of what we mean by TBI or traumatic brain injury, what sort of encompassed in that umbrella term. Uh, first of all, I just want to remind everybody here in case you're ever dealing with a situation where you see a rider who's fallen and you're concerned they've had a head injury, you always have to assume in an unconscious patient or in a patient that's very confused that they may have an associated spine injury. The highest risk factor for a cervical spine injury is actually a concurrent head injury. So any, any person in the situation needs to be immobilized as much as possible when you're initially evaluating them. Um, of course, before you deal with the treatment of a head injury, you have to deal with the treatment of those fundamental things that are going to keep that patient alive for the next 10 minutes while you know, they get loaded into an ambulance and taken to the, uh, the uh, emergency room. And so that means their airway, their ability to breathe, um, their circulation, et cetera. So if someone is unconscious and not breathing, their airway and their breathing and CPR uh, trumps any other issue that may be going on. Uh, in terms of types of TBI, I think can be, these can be grouped into a few categories. First of all, we deal with skull fractures uh, of a variety of types from, uh, from very benign to severe. We also um, deal with intracranial hematomas. These are things as neurosurgeons that we operate on fairly frequently. Um, we also deal with things called contusions and shear hemorrhages, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what those terms mean. And then finally, as I said earlier, concussions are included into this umbrella term of TBI, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about those specifically later. So skull fractures and hematomas often go together. Um, skull fractures can be very mild. They can be something that's treated easily with essentially no management needed and just a little bit of time to heal. They can also be very severe and operative. As you see, and this is a CT scan of a patient that has a severe depressed skull fracture. That's something that's not going to get better on its own, obviously. Um, important things to understand about diagnosing skull fractures, if you see someone have a fall, we can't diagnose these based on palpation. Just feeling someone's head and feeling a big goose egg or the lack of a big goose egg tells you nothing about whether that person has a fracture. Um, in addition, there's not always an associated laceration. You can have a fracture despite wearing a helmet. Uh, in addition, these can occur even with very mild brain injury. And finally, the most important thing to understand is if there's any suspicion for this, which in the lay public is probably going to be anybody that seems to have a significant skull in, uh, head injury, patient really needs to be referred to the emergency room for evaluation, and a CT scan is the way that we work those up. Uh, there's a specific subtype of skull fractures that are actually very common in riders, uh, which is called a basilar skull fracture. And this is essentially something that, a fracture that comes across the base of the skull. Uh, these can present often in a delayed fashion. People will complain of hearing loss, complain of balance issues. Um, they may have spinal fluid that comes out of their nose or ear. If you ever see clear fluid coming out of anywhere it's not supposed to be coming out of, that's a bad sign from a neurosurgical standpoint. Um, sometimes these patients can complain of a loss of a sense of smell or taste a day or two after an injury. And they can develop what we call raccoon eyes, bruising around the eyes. It looks like just a black eye, 
or even bruising, bruising over the mastoid process, which is back here behind your ear. This is just an example of what those things look like. That's a pretty obvious example of raccoon eyes, uh, but sometimes it can be less obvious than that and can look just like somebody hit their face. Um, that's what I was referring to as battle sign, bruising behind the ear. That can indicate a severe fracture to the skull base, which could have vascular injury associated with it, injury to the carotid artery and whatnot, and that may not be picked up immediately after an accident. Uh, that's a very unflattering picture of myself um, with a basilar skull fracture after uh, an accident on a novice event course. Uh, and I think I'm illustrating, unfortunately, the uh, unilateral raccoon eye pretty well there. So one of the things that we it really gets us worried in the neurosurgical community is the uh, chance or the risk of intracranial hematomas from uh, athletic sports injury. These are the things that frustrate us because they're relatively easily treated if they're diagnosed quickly, but they can be fatal if they're misdiagnosed. Um, this is Natasha Richardson. Many of you may have been familiar with her story. She was an actress who was skiing, had a fall, had a head injury, seemed a little bit stunned, but felt okay, was seen by ski patrol, didn't want to go to the hospital, uh, got down the mountain, said she was just going to go rest and you know, get, get, take a break in her room, went back to her room, maybe had a little bit of nausea and vomiting, but no localizing neurologic signs. And uh, then suddenly, within a period of a couple hours of resting, uh, died from her head injury, and she had an intracranial hematoma. Uh, there is this concept of the lucid interval with injuries of this type, where a patient may initially seem a little bit off and then seem okay. And during that time, that hematoma is slowly enlarging, and they may go from seeming okay to being in severe neurologic distress, respiratory distress, and, and herniating and dying within a very short period of time. So anyone that you see that ha is having a severe headache with or without vomiting, seems lethargic, and certainly anybody who has any asymmetry of their pupils with one of those associated symptoms is somebody that needs to be seen immediately in the emergency room, and they, that's, that merits a 911 call rather than a drive to the emergency room. When we see these in the ER, and we do see them frequently, um, they, they're patients that we rush straight to the operating room. Uh, we like taking care of these patients when we see them at the right time because they can be very satisfying. We can get a patient with a scan like that to the operating room within five or ten minutes. That person can be you know, 20 minutes away from death and uh, we remove that side of the bone. We're able to evacuate that hematoma and oftentimes those patients walk out of the hospital completely normally within two or three days. Um, so the key here is just not missing something like that early on and uh, getting them to our care too late. I mentioned the term contusions. This is probably a more common thing that we see in equestrian brain injuries. Contusions are essentially bruises of the brain. This is again a CT scan of a, of, um, a head injured patient that shows multiple little bright spots throughout the brain that you can see there. Those are small uh, hemorrhages that are contusions essentially and they look to me just like a bruise on your arm or your leg would look when you, you know, suffer trauma to that area. They can indicate focal damage. They indicate that that specific part of the brain right there has been damaged in some way. The key issue with contusions is that they continue to swell. Just like when you have a bad bruise on your hip when you fall off, it's going to swell over the next few days and get more painful and look terrible and there's going to be all kinds of changes to the color and whatnot. Well, that's going on in your brain when you have a contusion like this as well. And most contusions swell over a period of two to five days after the injury. What's frustrating for us is that sometimes these patients come in looking very good on post-injury day one, and then that swelling process can quickly get out of control, and they can deteriorate quickly even in our ICU while we're watching them closely. Swelling like this contributes to high intracranial pressure. The brain doesn't like to be under abnormal pressure, and that can cause damage to other areas of the brain that were not initially caused by the injury. So this is something that we have to watch very closely in the ICU. Another term that you'll hear frequently in the TBI literature is the term shear hemorrhage. Shear hemorrhages are these small little dots that you see in the brain often uh, occur 
at the junction of the gray matter of the brain, which is the cortex and the, the neurons that do the thinking, and the white matter of the brain, which are the conduction tracks. Shear hemorrhages are often associated with an acceleration or deceleration injury and also a severe rotational injury. Sometimes an isolated shear is very minor. You see a patient who looks completely neurologically normal. We watch them for a day or so. They do fine. We send them out. There's no issue. And a patient that has a scan like this where you see multiple shear, hemorrh shear hemorrhages in different locations, that can indicate severe subcortical dysfunction, which means uh, dysfunction of those tracks that conduct all the information through the brain and down to the spinal cord. These type of injuries are associated with something called DAI that you may have heard of before, which is diffuse axonal injury. And that's basically injury that occurs to those conduction tracks throughout the brain and can cause a person to be persistently comatose or persistent vegetative state uh, and ultimately can cause a person to die from an injury like this. So these kind of run the gamut from mild to severe. So how do we diagnose these things? Um, the most important first step for a neurosurgeon is to get a clinical exam of a patient, understand exactly where they stand in terms of their mental status, what they understand, what they don't understand, can they tell me their name, where we are, answer simple questions, that sort of thing, and also look at their motor strength. Do they have weakness on one side of their body and those sorts of things. We do that very quickly in just a period of a minute or two within the emergency room setting. The imaging standard for dealing with head injuries is going to be a CT scan, just like I've shown you a bunch of pictures here. There's a few reasons for that. One is it's very quick. Uh, most major trauma centers have an, a CT scanner in their emergency room now. At my center, we can get a CT scan within five minutes of a patient hitting the door of the emergency room and have it available and online for everybody to see all over the hospital. Um, they're also relatively inexpensive, and they give us a good, immediate, quick view of, of, of what's going on. Um, sometimes MRI can be useful, especially in terms of prognosis. A few days after an injury, if we have a patient whose exam is really is not improving and we're surprised by that, oftentimes we'll get an MRI to look into more detail about what's going on, those deep structures of the brain, and see if there's injury there. But that's not usually something we do up front because it takes a long time. We don't want to send patients down to a scanner for an hour when we're not sure what's going on with them. Um, one of the things that Lindsay had mentioned she wanted me to touch base on um, because there's been some questions about it was a new blood biomarker that's being used occasionally in um, diagnosis of brain injuries. And this is called S100. Uh, this is a molecule that's released from the cells of the brain when they're injured, and that can be in a traumatic injury, but it can also occur in other degenerative neurologic diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, et cetera. The nice thing is that you can measure this molecule in the blood. It's not being used really anywhere clinically in the United States right now that I'm aware of, but it, there's a lot of interest in using it in the military. Um, if you test the blood of someone who may or may not have had head trauma, and you don't find an elevation of this marker, you can be pretty sure that that person doesn't have a significant head injury. And so it's useful for ruling out head injury in those settings. Um, elevation of this marker me tells you, okay, they've had a head injury of some kind. The problem is, as a neurosurgeon, that doesn't tell me very much because the next thing I'm gonna want is that CT scan to show me exactly what type of injury I'm dealing with and tell me if I need to take this patient to the operating room. And that's why I think this isn't really going to necessarily have a lot of um, use on a diagnostic standpoint clinically in the United States because CAT scans and things like that are pretty readily available at this point. The, the way I think we may see this being used more frequently in the future is uh, in monitoring patients who we know have had a brain injury, those patients I was talking about who sometimes deteriorate two or three days after the injury. It's been shown in some research studies that this marker can, become, they can slowly become elevated before they show a clinical deterioration, before their neurologic exam gets worse. And so there may be patients that we start monitoring with you know, daily measurements of this marker to see if we can predict the problem before it starts so that we can get a handle on it as quickly as possible. So how do we treat traumatic brain injury? I've already touched on this a little bit. Um, first of all, anyone with a significant traumatic brain injury really needs to be taken care of at a, a trauma center, and so oftentimes it's appropriate to stabilize these patients at a small local ER and then bring them to a trauma center from there. Uh, in terms of the interventions that we do, as I said, we sometimes take people rapidly to the operating room, take off a piece of the skull, evacuate a hematoma, 
plus or minus put that piece of the skull back on. Um, we can also put drains into the fluid-filled spaces in the brain to allow spinal fluid to drain off to release pressure. And we can measure the intracranial pressure that way uh, and manage that medically with some medicines that are helpful for kind of drying out the brain and keeping it from swelling as much as we can. That said, this is a very difficult problem to treat. Uh, there are a few types of injuries, like those hematomas I was mentioning, that are very satisfying. We can see patients that are doing really poorly, and we can make them a lot better. For every one of those patients, there's unfortunately eight to ten patients who have an injury that we can't treat with surgery, and we basically have to try to support the brain and allow it to heal itself as best it can. And that's a frustrating thing for those of us that um, take care of those patients, and certainly for people, family members that are having to watch a patient go through that. Uh, in terms of the recovery, one of the most important things to understand is that recovery from a neurologic injury takes months to years. Uh, I typically tell patients they're going to continue to see improvement for about 18 months. After that, things really slow down. Uh, that first couple of months, you're going to see the most rapid improvement, and then you're going to start to see some plateaus in there. But you can expect to see improvement for about that period of time. The, the key to recovery is intensive rehabilitation, physical therapy, speech therapy, et cetera. Unfortunately, that's very expensive. Um, and the direct costs, just the medical costs of a severe brain injury range from about $1.5 to $3 million per person. That doesn't include the indirect costs of that person not being able to make an income, their family members having to leave their jobs and travel to be with that person and to help support them in their recovery. Finally, I'd say that functional outcomes are really unpredictable, and this is something that's incredibly frustrating to us. Um, we see mo we, we're pretty good at saying that we can predict most patients that are not going to have a significant functional recovery when we see them after about five days after an injury, but occasionally there's patients that surprise us, and we have patients that walk back into the clinic, and they have some long-term problems, but they are living a good functional life, even though I wouldn't have predicted that five or six days after their accident. On the other hand, we see patients that initially look really good when we bring them into the hospital. They suffer some significant intracranial swelling and whatnot, and you know, they, don't, they don't end up ever leaving the hospital. Uh, so that's a very frustrating thing for us, especially when we're advising families on the decisions that they have to make as they go through this process. I'll just mention quickly the parts of the brain that are the most vulnerable to this type of injury won't surprise anyone that's ever had to uh, deal with a traumatic brain injury in their own life. Um, it's the parts of the brain that really handle emotional learning, um, emotional and social responsiveness, uh, speech, uh, some of those executive judgments, the ability to control what you say and what you and uh, to kind of handle yourself socially. A lot of those things are gone even in the setting of a mild brain injury and uh, may improve over time but require a lot of work and a lot of therapy. Next slide, please. And finally, I'd say there's a few other things that weigh into that functional recovery, and some of that is sort of what your baseline is. People that have had multiple head injuries in the past do worse when they have a severe head injury. In addition, people that have some other risk factors, some of which may be genetic and you may not even know or be aware of, and as well as some psychological problems up front, do, much, do uh, a lot more poorly. Finally, I would just say, while we wish that we had a great animal model so that we could start testing a lot of different lab interventions for this kind of a problem, we don't. Um, there is not a good animal or experimental model out there that can replicate uh, traumatic brain injuries in humans. As I said, the, the areas of the brain that are the most vulnerable to these injuries are really the areas of the brain that make us human. They're the areas that make us who we are. And it's difficult to test those sorts of things in a mouse or a rat. And this is something we struggle with from the research side. So finally, just to summarize, TBI is a huge problem in the sport, both in recreational equestrians and in professionals. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a very horsey town. We see many riders coming in through our ER, many of whom have severe injuries. It's very frustrating to me as an equestrian myself um, how many unhelmeted uh, patients we have that come in. Oftentimes they're children, 
oftentimes are recreational backyard riders, oftentimes their family is totally unaware of the need for wearing helmets, uh, and it's an incredibly frustrating situation to try to take care of a patient who you know is not going to do well um, when you yourself have the power to potentially change that. And that's why I'm really thankful for being allowed to come and speak with you all today. As I said, early detection of these injuries is critical. Um, getting these patients to the appropriate treatment center in, as soon as possible is key to their recovery, as well as all of that expensive but critical rehabilitation that comes down the line. Fundamentally, the way that we can best battle this disease is by preventing it. We don't have a lot of ways to cure this problem once it's happened, but we do have some ways to prevent it from happening in the first place, and that's why we're all here today. So I'll be happy to take any questions for a couple of minutes if there's anything specifically I can answer for anyone. We don't know why on a biochemical level. Um, I think it probably has something to do with the brain's ability to make new connections. Um, the brain, the neural tissue in general is the slowest tissue to heal in the body. That's why it takes 18 months to two years to see reco full recovery from these kinds of accidents. Um, the brain has some ability, even in adults, to rewire itself a little bit to um, form new connections that can substitute for old ones. Uh, I think people who, certainly we know that people who have, suffer a second head injury within a period, a, a relatively short period of time, often suffer a much more severe injury. And I think that's because that healing process has not been allowed to kind of come to fruition. Uh, and that healing process probably takes years, ultimately. Some of that is relearning on the part of the person and forming new connections that allow you to bypass those injured areas, and part of it is on a cellular level. Um, I don't know that we can say exactly why it is that once you've had a single head injury, you're far more, or single concussion, for example, and I'll talk about this this afternoon, you're five times more likely to have another concussion at some point in your life. But we do know that there's certainly a critical period of you know, months to even maybe a year or two after that initial concussion that you're at even more increased risk. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a serious problem in terms of the culture of our sport. Um, I have certainly ridden and jumped back on and fallen off and jumped back on many times in my life, and I understand that. Uh, however, most coaches, I think, are not necessarily equipped to evaluate a rider that's fallen and make a good judgment about whether that person may have a head injury. Um, I think that's why education is really critical in terms of specifically dealing with concussion and the signs and symptoms of that. Uh, I think there are certainly scenarios where somebody pops off and, you know, they're, they're fine and as an adult certainly it's fairly easy to, you know, often interpret that for yourself and make that decision to get back on the horse yourself, but I think we need to be a lot more cautious than we have been traditionally in equestrian sport. You know, there's, I mean, there's classic sayings about getting back up on the horse that threw you. The reality is, if you get back up on the horse and you're confused, your balance is off, your equilibrium is off, uh, you're much more likely to get yourself, that horse, and anybody that's around you into a lot more trouble. Uh, so I think I would highly recommend caution, especially on the, you know, with children on the, from the standpoint of parents and coaches in terms of letting, if, if nothing else, letting that person sit out for a few minutes, checking them clearly. I'm going to go through this afternoon some of the ways that you can pick up a concussion, even in someone who has a mild one. And um, I think the more coaches we can have understand that, be able to do those things and be able to kind of provide that sort of sideline evaluation of someone, uh, the better. And then, you know, I think there's settings where it's fine to get back on, and there's also settings where it's probably best to say, let's just do this another day. 
Sure. So he was um, asking me to talk a little bit about the uh, problem of a second impact in, uh, shortly after an initial head injury and how that seems to be a much more severe problem in young people than it is in uh, people probably in their 30s and beyond. And I'll unfortunately have to include myself in that old person group now, I guess. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that this afternoon as well. But there's a, um, there's a syndrome called second impact syndrome, which was initially written up in the 70s. And it's very rare, but it's a sort of horrifying uh, entity where an athlete may have an initial head injury that seems relatively mild, often just a concussion with some headaches, maybe a little nausea and whatnot, uh, but no neurologic signs or symptoms. And that person goes back into the field of play too soon. They're still having symptoms, and they suffer a second impact within a short period of time. We're talking about a week or two, probably. And there is a process by which the brain reacts to that with a severe swelling response. And those patients can develop severe intracranial edema that can be completely uncontrollable with medications and even surgery to try to salvage um, that situation. And second impact syndrome has really only been reported in probably 30 or 40 athletes uh, in the last 30 years, but it has about a 50% mortality rate and it has a 100% permanent morbidity rate. So 100% of patients that have been reported with that sort of a syndrome uh, end up with permanent neurologic disorders. And it, there's not a good way to figure out who was really at risk for that beyond to say we know that these are adolescent athletes. And I think that may have something to do with the fact that um, the brain is much more full in young people. Uh, we know, unfortunately, as we all get older, we suffer some basic atrophy of our brain. Uh, if you take a scan of an 18-year-old, their brain fills up that whole space, and there's very little spinal fluid around it, and it's full and robust and bright. If you take the uh, picture of the brain of a 55-year-old you know, person, it's very different. There's a lot more space in there, and there's a lot more allowance for swelling if it occurs. And I think that may be part of it. We don't really know, in all, in, in all fairness, what exactly causes that, but we know that there's certain people that are at risk, and that's something that really scares those of us that treat concussions and why we don't want people to go back to impact sports too early, because we know there's a small risk that, of a life-threatening type of injury. Mm -hmm. It has been mostly reported in men, but I do not believe it's necessarily limited to them. Uh, this is data that really came out of the football literature, and I think that's where it's certainly been seen the most. We do know that women are actually more likely to suffer a concussion from equivalent blows than men, and are more likely to, dis to suffer permanent neurologic disability from an equivalent head injury. So I don't think there's any reason to suspect that women couldn't develop second impact syndrome, but I'm not sure off the top of my head whether it's been reported in a female athlete or not. Um, the, I would expect that, you know, as I said, height of fall is really the most important predicting factor when, you know, in determining the severity of a TBI. And so I would predict that someone that falls from a, you know, a driving cart is going to be as at risk as someone that falls from the back of a horse. Um, I, I'm not sure whether there's things about the, veloc you know, the, the mechanics of a crash that may be different, that may slow a fall. It's not maybe like just being bucked off and basically being dropped from 10 feet in the air on your head. I don't know enough about the sport, honestly, to know whether there's mechanical differences in the way people fall that make a difference. But I would certainly expect that, you know, people that are driving are at risk for those injuries as much as a, someone that's on the back of a horse. I think uh, we don't have as much data for equestrian injuries as we we should. And that's something I'm trying to promote at the FEI level. Eventing has been uh, probably the standard bearer for data collection. And our data over the last two years, and this, I'm speaking from an FEI standpoint, our data on reporting of falls, type of jump, uh, mechanism of the fall is much, much better than it was uh, four or five years ago for slow rotational falls, this type thing. And that helps us as physicians 
and as safety advocates, tell manufacturers what we need as far as design, what kind of impact uh, is happening, just, just like Dr. Chambliss was talking about, what happens when you fall off uh, a cart or when you have driving accident. There's obviously multiple different mechanisms for injury, but you want to protect against certainly the most common ones and hopefully as many mechanisms of injury as possible. And uh, eventing has done a good job in injury and data collection. Um, previously, I can tell you internationally, there, there are fatalities, and in some countries at national competitions, uh, there have been two fatalities that I know of in, in a European country. And the rider fatally injured never even was taken to a hospital or a morgue or a facility. They were just taken to the funeral home. And so they were assumed to have this injury or that injury as the cause of death. So the, obviously the data collection in that situation is anecdotal. It's like, well, we think they broke their neck or we think they had a head injury, but they died so they took them to the funeral home. Well, that doesn't help us as physicians to try to understand the mechanism of injury. What really happened? How could we prevent that? And so um, hopefully we're getting better at data collection on injuries. I think that's true not just in equestrian sports, but in multiple sports. At the IOC level, we talk about that. We had a meeting in, uh, actually it was in Monaco. Uh, the IOC meets at really nice places, by the way. But uh, the physicians for each Olympic sport met, and we're trying to get a little more harmonized data collection. Obviously, injuries in some sports are trivial compared to what we deal with in, in equestrian sports but at least have some sort of a uniform database and data collection to prevent injuries and to try to make, make all sports a little bit safer from a competitive standpoint. So part of this is actually improving our data collection so that we can improve the designs of helmets and body protectors and we can make our sport safer. Change our rules, change the jumps, change the footing, whatever we need to do. It, it's really a multifactorial uh, decision on how we make our sport safer. If that's something we're trying to promote, and the data collection, I think, is getting better. But I don't think we specifically back around to the driving. I don't think we have data, to my knowledge, uh, right on driving accidents that's very reliable as far as numbers of competitors. We do now for eventing. You know, number of fences jumped, uh, the, the fatality rate, the injury rate, what type fence it was, much more scientific, I think, in the approach. And that's going to help us going forward. So. And I'll say, I think one of the difficulties is that, as we all know as equestrians, many of the accidents that take place take place outside of competition and in your own arena at home, in your own backyard, on the trail, you know. And um, honestly, that's what we see in our practice at you know, a trauma center far. I mean, I can count on one hand the number. We have a, we have a large hunter-jumper facility. We have a number of competitions that take place in Nashville every year, steeplechase, eventing. And uh, I can count on one hand the number of patients I've seen that have had a significant head injury obtained during, during one of those competitions. But I see three patients a week with a significant head injury related to a riding accident outside of competition. And we don't have a good way of collecting that data at all beyond to collect it within the hospital setting itself. Um, most of the, some of the statistics I presented today um, about the differences between disciplines and things like that actually come from Canada. Um, where they have a, a national health system, and so they're able to pool that data a little bit more easily than we are. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things we're going to continue to struggle with, is getting to those people who aren't maybe you know, as, um, as educated about this issue as some of our high-level competitors, but are recreational riders that are just as much at risk, if perhaps not more at risk, because they're riding in uncontrolled settings without good footing and the safest fences. and the best body protectors and helmets and those things.